So uh, today we are going to speak about sustainable APIs, um, at least how we try to make them sustainable at Luca. You all have in mind what REST API should be, exposing JSON resources linked together through hypermedia data. Um, but under the wood, there is no much guidelines on how to build those APIs. As REST of Farine for a long time, um, we have discovered domain-driven design not too long ago. DDD helped us build those APIs and make choices on how to cut our domains apart. Last but not least, the Zachman framework is a real pattern for designing those APIs, ensuring reusability and scalability. So today we'll dive into domain-driven design, make a short REST API architecture reminder, and explain how we rely on the Zachman framework for the big picture. So let's start with the context. I'm Nicolas Fogu, CTO at Luca. Uh, our mantra is to make business applications <coughs> that act well, speak well, and look well. By business, we mean HR. We, we do leave management system, expense management, employee file, time management, and payroll distribution system. We have 50 people in the product field organized around each application. That's to say five to eight people including UI, UX, and PMs. We could add integrate well to our mantra, and that's when REST APIs are usually concerned. We are new to DDD compared to REST APIs. We have three years of production proof practice of DDD on the one hand, and more than 10 years of daily practice of REST APIs on the other hand. What surprised me the most when I discovered DDD is the predominant position of the domain layer compared to the web layer, for instance. Contrast, REST APIs always stand on the web surface. So our daily challenge at Luca is to try to fit them together to get the best of each. The term domain-driven design has been coined by Eric Evans that you saw just before. In 2003, Inuit has become a real Bible for DDDers like us. At that time, people were paying too much attention to tool. Uh, like database mapper or any kind of framework, um, trying to fit them, their code into the tool instead of the tool being here to help them implement their business concept. And the domain expert left behind trying to tell them that what he meant was a will. Heavens wanted to reverse that situation, bringing domain concepts and discussion around them, the main concern of product people. He wanted to break the wall between domain experts and software makers. Because DDD is all about naming things, which is the harder thing in computer science before cache invalidation. But at the PM level, you as a PM or developer, you should meet the domain expert. And not only once at the beginning of your project, but on a regular basis. Each time you need to dig to a misunderstood part of the spec, you need to align with the domain expert. Depending on your project, the domain expert, it could be your customer, it could be your PM, or it could be you. Even it, uh, it's better to avoid this last possibility. Ubiquitous language means two things. The first one is that everybody involved in the project should use the same language, from the sales brochure to the very nested object inside your code. If you come up with a new word, um, you should poke the domain expert and ask them if this thing exists in the terminology. And if not, you have come up with somebody new that, uh, that only appear in your code. The second is that every concept will have a name, and two separate concepts cannot have the same name. And if so, you must be explicit. What is account? Is it banking account, leave account, user account? Wouldn't it be better if you use the term bank account in the first place? So stick with explicit names. Everybody will save time. And apart from serving time, what ubiquitous language brings is that non-tech people can look at your code and feel home. They understand what they read, given they know a little bit of your programming language grammar. And this is a good way to move to TDD or BDD, test-driven design or behavior-driven design, where PMs write pseudo-language scenarios that rely on your code. As far as we are concerned at Luca, we didn't implement BDD yet, but only TDD at the developer level. So speaking domain first, help align people and break boundaries. The second, the second most important 
important uh, subject I wanted to share with you today about DDD is, is the notion of bounded context. And the hardest thing in applying bounded context is to define the boundaries with which you can split a system into multiple subsystems, like the human cell of the skin. <coughs> because we all agree that big fast systems are not scalable anymore and probably never have been. So bounded concepts are here to help you tackling complexity, as Heaven stated in his book. For instance, at Luca, we have a monolith, our legacy code, that we are currently splitting into parts. As I said, we are organized around each application, so it was pretty obvious for us that our coarse grain level of bounded context will be those applications, the live management application, etc. But maybe we should split them into smaller parts, and that's another question. Bounded context should be loosely coupled, and we consider that two, bound, two different bounded contexts should not run together and only communicates across the network using HTTP calls or maybe web-based message broker, for instance. Considering bounded context as isolated application means that you can specialize at each level. For instance, for an image processing, for an image application, you will allocate more processing units. For an archive management, more, uh, more, um, more storage, for instance. Bounded context allows you to focus on a particular problem, on a particular part of a complex problem or on a particular side of a problem. You can dig deeper than if you are trying to address the problem as a whole. So let's now look at the building blocks that bounded context lean on. A nice thing I wanted to show you today about DDD is the concept of value object. But first, I need to tell you about entities and aggregates. DDD emphasizes the object-oriented uh, approach that every developer knows well. Instead of services containing all the business logic, DDD invites you to wrap that inside entities. So entities are your object, your concept, like the element of the wheel here. And, and they, they not only contain the state of the application, but also, but also its behavior. This is called rich domain model by Eric Evans. Um, opposed to an anemic domain model when state management and, um, and behavior are outside of the entities. Entities are grouped in aggregates, a container that, uh, that, con that holds several entities. And one entity is called the aggregate root. That's the only entity that the outer world can interact with. So here, for instance, it would be the, the spindle of the wheel. So, aggregate represented by one aggregate root. But what's really innovative in domain-driven design is the concept of value objects. These are disposable, immutable objects that help entities orga to organize and validate their state. The screws might be the value object in this example. Let's take a more relevant example for you. To build the user entity, for instance, instead of sending polytype parameters like last name, first name, address, login, etc. You will first build those value objects, complex object, an identity object, an address object, a credential object, composed of uh, strings, last name, first name, street number, etc. And then you will use this value object inside the, the user constructor. Creating this intermediate layer of object allows you to validate and test one, each one independently and reinforce the richness of your domain. And method signature are a lot better now because you cannot uh, mismatch the order of the parameters any, any, anymore because they are of different types. So value objects are really powerful and they help you do better low-level architecture and are highly, highly reusable in other parts of, the, of your domain. All we have seen for now in DDD reside in which is called the domain layer the deeper layer in DDD design. This layer contains all your business logic expressed inside bounded context through aggregates, entities, and value objects. And it depends on nothing concrete, no file system, no database, no external tool. It only depends on abstraction of these technical elements. And there is at least three other layers in DDD. 
the application layer that is the front door of your domain dealing with the outer world, the web layer that, is, that takes incoming requests to your application, and the infrastructure layer, which contains all the concrete technical elements to connect your domain to the real world in a production environment. The web layer is responsible for injecting at runtime those, those, those concrete blocks from the infrastructure layer to the domain layer. This is called inversion of control, and it works well with dependency injection. Layered that way, your domain is fully unit testable and completely decoupled from outer dependencies. However, as DDD emphasizes the inner domain modeling, it lacks of guidance on how to expose this rich domain model to the outer world. <coughs> on top of the application layer stands the user interface, which is consumer-oriented, poorly architecture, and changes frequently. So we don't really have a strong concept on which to rely on as for the exposition surface of our domain. And that's when REST APIs come. As I said, we have a strong story with REST APIs, but I'll be, I'll be quick. In his maturity model that you can see here, Richardson defined four levels through REST. Let's see it in action with the, the use case of uh, updating a user address, for instance. Level zero here is when you use HTTP as a unique constraint. You can stay at this level and integrate your application using this, this kind of RPC call. Or you can decide to express part of your application as resources, like the user here. You can even structure your resources into aggregation of multiple resources and make extensive use of the, of the HTTP, HTTP verbs. Then you are eligible to level two. Here we have decided to create an address sub resource to isolate the address lifecycle from the user. It enables links between resources as defined in ATO's principle. Just one command to the address sub resource is not really a sub resource because we make a put onto it to change the address property of a user. So it's much more like a property. Some calls that the put anti pattern on advice instead to use to clearly define resources. A move, for instance, assuming a user can move multiple times in his life, and you make a post to it whenever a user changes of address. This is called reification of abstract concept by Zachman that we will see a bit later. And it helps you do better architecture. To sum up, as DDD comes with bounded context that helps better total decoupling between parts of your application, REST API seems decoupled and scalable by design as the web is. If you stick with resource reference by the real URLs, you will enable caching at scale and, sec and avoid security issue. These constraints upon REST APIs makes REST and DDD work well together. We didn't invent those synergies, someone else did, maybe without knowing it. John Zachman, I met him. He's an old man now. He has worked for IBM for a long time, uh, trying to model business processes. In late 80s, he designed his framework that we can compare to this, this matrix on the right. The rows represent the different layer of an organization. The plan of view, it's like the vision of the CEO, and the use of view, it's like the technical assets of a, a developer or, or DBA, for instance. And the columns, they represent the, what he called the primitive, what, how, who, where, why, and, and when. Um, he stated that any problem can be broken into simple parts inside the cells of the matrix. You just have to answer the primitive question and see it from different perspectives. The link that we can make between Zachman and our subject today is that we should only concentrate on the primitives. Let's see an example from one of our applications, the home. That's the landing page that we show to our users when they log in. It shows information about all the applications they are using. On the left, we have three blocks showing information about their colleagues. The first one is the absent of the day, the birthday, and the newcomers. If three different developers were to implement those blocks, or if you rush on implementation instead of stepping back, 
and find common features to this block, you will probably come up with this kind of APIs. An absent APIs, exposing the names on the picture, a birthday APIs, with more or less the same information, and the new commerce APIs, with day of arrival and job title. These APIs are composite because they hide the concept of an employee or user, uh, depending on your ubiquitous language. With three APIs like this, you can personalize each of them. You can optimize, make use of HTTP cache because they, this information won't change during the day. But there is something more important, uh, architecture and good design and security. What if your company is split into two legal entities and you cannot see people from each other? Will the developer of these APIs handle that? We don't know. The equivalent in terms of primitive will then be a user API. For the birthday on the new commerce, it's easy because, because it corresponds to direct property of the, of the user, of its state. But for the, the absent of the day, we have to, vo to wonder if there is a is present property on the user. If so, it's calculated. So it hides another primitive that we didn't find. In fact, this block has to, has to do with the leave management system. So it hides the, the, the leave primitive from the leave API. I will then query the leave API for the leave that occurs today and ask for the owner property, which is of type user, is linked to the user API, and then gather the IDs of the user, and then ask the user API for, for the information of the users. Doing it this way, we have reused primitive that already exist in our application. We didn't create any API, we're just using uh, formerly primitives. Um, and these APIs, they handle security already. We had to make four calls, four HTTP calls instead of three, but for the sake of good design and decoupling between, the, the, between APIs. We then understand why Zachman says that primitives are reusable. Primitives address an architectural problem, whereas composite correspond to a single usage and are consumer-oriented. When concentrated on defining those primitives, you can dig to an excruciating level of detail that the same ID be unbounded context in DDD. Primitives are linked together through association, as we have seen between the leave and the, the user API. The hard part is to find those primitives, but that's the only way of making architecture. Finding those primitives is what you do when you go meet the, exp the domain expert as the DDD encourages you to do. A far more complex problem that was solved during the 90s was the discovery of primary chemical elements before that, chemists dealt with compound elements until they discovered that these elements were in fact composed of primary elements. Zachman tries to do the same thing but with enterprise building blocks. And each of us, we have in our application, we have to find those building blocks. At Luca, we try to follow this three pillar of software development. We build your application applying the principle of domain-driven design. Bounded context, rich domain model, layer architecture. We expose our domain through primary REST APIs that ensure security and reusability and scalability by design. And we try to implement all of that following the Zachman framework. We call that process RDD for REST-driven domain and we made a C-sharp framework out of it. Drop me an email if you are interested in using it in your own project. So that's it for today. Thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be gl glad to help. <laughs>